Hello, everybody. I'm PJ Trudeau. Thank you so much for joining the HR Roundtable. It is wonderful to have everyone with us today uh, as we look at navigating change as an HR leader. I'm very happy to have with us today uh, Allison French, who is the Managing Director of Alto Solutions. Uh, in an increasingly impersonal world, Allison is passionate about helping organizations and individuals make the right connections to create harmony and success. As Managing Director of Alto Solutions, she employs brain science in her approach to organizational change, communications, and leadership. An experienced facilitator, trainer, and coach, Allison has clients within the association, education, government, and private sectors for more than 20 years. Uh, she's been facilitating uh, strategic planning meetings, corporate retreats, and skills training workshops, as well as an in-depth change leadership and team assignments and strategic communication campaigns. So she's definitely had experience in quite a lot of different areas and I think really is going to be able to provide us some fantastic tools today on how to navigate change. So Allison, let me turn it over to you. Thank you, PJ. It's great to be here today on this Friday morning, and it's nice to see everyone as well. Um, I'm going to start with something that might look a little bit familiar. When we talk about change, we all want change, right? It makes things better. Everybody wants change. But when we go and actually dig deep and say, who wants to change, we get crickets. People don't feel like they actually want to change. And we want to talk a little bit about why that is. Um, and in order to do so today, um, I'm going to start with something that might feel a little bit different for you. If you don't have your camera on, I'm going to ask you to put it on. Um, we're going to do an opening activity that actually requires us to see each other. Uh, and you're going to kind of work through something that has to do with change. And then we're going to talk about it. Uh, so instead of jumping right into some sort of lecture, we're going to turn cameras on, be able to take a look at each other. What I'm going to ask you to do is to look through your Zoom, look at other people in the Zoom. Sometimes we don't do that. Sometimes we're just focused on what we look like, or maybe we're, you're looking at me or you're looking at PJ. So what I want you to do is to pick someone else in the Zoom right now. Pick someone else in the Zoom and I'm going to ask you to observe them for about 30 seconds. I know that sounds like it's gonna be a long time, but we're gonna just pick one person, look at them, look at their face, and if there's anything around them, notice their environment. Um, and so I'm gonna give you 30 seconds in about two seconds now. Go ahead and just observe them silently. Okay, that was about 30 seconds. And if you're just joining us, um, what I just had folks do is turn cameras on and observe, pick person out, another person in the Zoom and observe them for about 30 seconds. Now I'm actually gonna ask you to turn your camera off for just a moment and change three things about your appearance. Turn your camera off and change three things about your appearance. Really quickly, just whatever comes to mind. And when you're ready, when you've done that, go ahead and put your camera back on. So as we're putting our cameras back on, see if you can find the person that you were observing. And I, what I want you to do is chat them and tell them what they changed. See if you've observed the changes that they made. So if you go into the chat and you can just private chat them and say, hey, I noticed that you did X, Y, and Z, are those the changes that you made? See if you can get some confirmation on that using the chat. And when you've, when you've finished and you've been able to 
identify the changes that people have made. Go ahead and give me a, a hands up sign, raise your hand, a thumbs up, something that I know that you've finished. Couple of more thumbs up. I'll give you guys a few more moments, good. All right. So what I'm gonna ask you to do now is to look at that person again, same person that you've been observing, I'm not gonna ask you to do it for 30 seconds, and then turn your camera off one more time and see if you can change three more things. So turn your camera back off. I see some people laughing already. I know it's ridiculous, isn't it? See if you can change three more things about yourself. And when you've done that, put your camera back on and do the same thing, identify, talk to the person on chat and see if you can figure it out. All right, we should be chatting each other at this point, seeing if you can figure out what was changed. All right. Now I've done this activity both in person and virtually. And when we're in person, we actually observe people for 60 seconds and we go three rounds of changes, if you can believe that. And it's a little bit of a sneaky exercise because most people think that I'm just asking you to be observant of changes. You know, what are, what are the things that people are changing about themselves? Are we observing them? But it's more than just that. This activity models seven change dynamics that people go through during change. So I wanna walk you through them real quick and please, please feel free to use the chat um, and talk about you know, your experience with it. I'm gonna give you some examples as I was observing, um, but please use the chat and, and share your experience with these different change dynamics. Because the first change dynamic is that people feel awkward. They feel uncomfortable, ill at ease, and self-conscious. Um, and as you might have felt when I said, look at somebody else on the Zoom for 30 seconds. That 30 seconds went for a really long time, didn't it? It felt like it was a really long time because we don't usually pause and be silent for 30 seconds and stare at somebody else on the Zoom. Now extrapolate that to in person. When I've done this activity with groups in person, they're standing there staring at each other for 60 seconds, not talking, just staring. A lot of, lot of awkward giggles, things like that going on, but people feel uncomfortable. It's something outside of the norm that I'm asking you to do. Um, you wouldn't normally do this sort of thing, especially right out of the gate on a Zoom meeting uh, or in person. So there's these feelings of just being self-conscious, being awkward whenever we're going through a change that's sort of how we feel initially. And then people think, typically people think about what they have to give up. And I definitely noticed in this group, and this happens all the time when I do this activity, things come off, glasses come off, sweaters come off, jewelry comes off. Now there were definitely some of you who put things on, which was wonderful, most people think first about what comes off, what they have to give up, and that's applicable in all sorts of change situations too. Most people don't see it as, oh, I might be gaining something. They see it as, what do I have to give up?
how many of you felt like you were kind of alone in this? Like you sort of had to figure this out. I see some nods, some smiles that you kind of had to figure this out all by yourself, but you were all doing this together, right? Everybody was in this together. We weren't all just in our own little, little bubbles doing this. Everybody was doing it together. Um, and when I do it in person, we actually, you know, see that people are doing it. They're standing around and they're doing it together. Um, and people can feel alone, even though everybody is going through the same change. People are concerned that they don't have enough resources. Um, here we are on Zoom. I'm asking you to change things. What in the world can I change? Especially I've asked you to change three things and then I've asked you to change three more things. So some people just put things back on, right? But people are concerned that they don't have enough resources. And I wanna give a couple of shout outs. Um, I noticed Taylor, I noticed Cheryl, and I noticed Crystal. All of you grabbed something. It wasn't just taking off glasses or changing your hair. You grabbed a mug. You grabbed um, I, I, a lot of a lot of coffee mugs were were in the in the frame. That was changing something. You had something at your disposal there on your desk on your table, and you grabbed it and you held it up, and that was changing your appearance. A lot of people don't think about that. They don't think that they have resources when there are actually resources in front of them. So that's something else, and and I'm really happy to see some people actually went a little bit outside of just what can I change on my person and use some of the resources that were available to them. People are at different levels of readiness for change. Some people said, this is fun. I think I saw in the chat that um, Stacy said, this is fun. I bet there's some of you that were like, oh my gosh, what is she doing to me? This is awful. Right? People are at very different levels of readiness for change. This is a very different activity than you've probably done in the past. And some people embrace it and some people don't. And when we're leading change or when we're in a position of HR and we're watching change happen around us and we're going through change, everybody's going to be at a different level. And there's nothing that says we can't sort of reach out our hand and help them. You know, in this activity, when it's done in person, I also say to people, and this goes to everybody feeling alone this goes to people being at different levels and this goes to resources you can help each other as well so when i do this when there's people physically in the room i say you know there's no reason why maybe you're standing back to back with the person that you're figuring out the changes for but maybe i'm looking at somebody else so i'm standing back to back with pj but i'm looking at christy and so christy maybe you and i are swapping a jacket or something like that maybe we're using each other's resources and we're helping each other these are things that people don't automatically think about um, when we're going through change the sixth change dynamic is that people can handle only so much change again i did this round two two times with three changes in person, we tend to do a little bit more with it. And I've noticed that people sometimes just flat out give up. They just sit down, they're done. Some people didn't even want to turn on their screens and participate in the activity. And that's fine and that's understandable, but people are at different levels of readiness and people can only handle so much change. When I asked you to do it a second time, I saw some people go, oh my gosh, you know, I can't, I can't handle that. I can't make another three changes. And then finally, when the pressure's taken off, when there's not something that's kind of prompting us to go forward with the change, we revert back to our old behaviors. We all put our glasses back on, we put our jewelry back on, we took the hood back off, we did all the things, <laughs> we did all the things that were the, the way they were in the beginning, we reverted back. Now I don't necessarily expect you to keep your glasses off because you probably can't see what's going on if you do that but it's just a modeling of what people go through during times of change. So I'd like to ask you all, which of these dynamics resonates most with you? We're gonna pull up a little poll and ask you what dynamic of those seven resonates the most with you? Just take a minute and vote for one of those. We'll give it a few more moments. A 
looks like we've got about almost 75% response at this point. Do we want to 84, even better. Do we want to share the results? So about 19% feel awkward, 10% thinking first about what you have to give up. Not, not a lot of people feeling alone. That's actually really great. Um, everybody's going through the same change. So you have that connection with other people, um, which is really important. Uh, the resource question and the levels of readiness, those are the two big ones. Um, and then being able to handle only so much change at 19% and reverting back to old behaviors at 5%. So it sounds like this idea of just these levels of readiness for change and being concerned that there's not enough resources are the ones that resonate most with, with this group. So let's talk a little bit. And again, please feel free to jump in on the chat if you have questions, if there's anything that comes up that resonates with you that you want to share. I want this to be as interactive as possible. Uh, and I want to share this model of transition and change that some of you may have seen before. It's, it's created by William Bridges, who wrote Managing Transitions. And before we can influence change, it's really important that we understand it. That's why we went through that activity just a few moments ago. Um, but what we sometimes forget is that change itself happens in a moment in time. Change is a new system. Change is a new org structure. Change is something you know that happens in a moment. Transition is how people adjust to the change. So the transition, if we have, let's say, a new system being implemented, is how we move to using it effectively vis-a-vis -vis our old systems. So if we don't consider the transitions, change can't always be successful. So we need to think about what people go through. There's these different phases and we're gonna walk through them and talk about what happens in each of these phases. Um, there's this ending phase, this part of kind of finality. We have to kind of let go of what was in the past. There's this neutral zone that we go through that we're still sort of questioning it. We've let go of what's go what was happening in the past, but we're not quite sure where we're headed yet. And then there's the new beginning. Um, and I liken it to a trapeze artist in the circus where you've got somebody swinging on the trapeze and you've got somebody on the other side whose job is to catch them. And the person who's swinging on the trapeze at some point needs to let go and have their ending zone. They need to let go. And when they're flying through the air, hoping that this other person will catch them, now they're in the neutral zone. They're in this gray area. Hopefully there's a net underneath them, but there may not be swinging through the air, and then finally the catcher grabs them and they swing into their new beginning. So it's a very simple way to look at that, but let's go into each one of these sections and talk about what it looks like and what we can do about it. So dealing with endings, how to let go. So here are some of the things that I have found have been useful. And I would love to hear as we're going through this, what are some of the things that you do? What resonates most with you? So identification of who's losing what and not sugarcoating it. We have been there so many times where people try to say, you know, this is all wonderful and great when maybe someone is losing something and we're always thinking about that first. We're always thinking about what we have to give up. So being transparent about what who's losing what um, and defining what's over, but also what isn't over. Sometimes we take that very kind of finality type of approach that it's all ending and nothing's going to be the same, when in reality there's only a small piece that's ending and there may be other pieces that, that do stay the same. If you are leading change in any capacity, whether you're a leader of a team that's going through change, whether it's your change that we're pushing through, whether you're just managing people who are going through change in the organization, accepting the reality and the importance of the losses. If you kind of go down two bullets, this, this change curve is very similar to the grief curve in a lot of ways. There are signs of grieving. There can be denial. There can be anger. And then eventually there's acceptance, but that doesn't come quickly. So really understanding that you might be seeing in this beginning phase, this ending phase, you may be seeing some signs very similar to grieving. Um, and as 
leaders and as people who support others, we want to acknowledge whatever people might be feeling as a loss openly, sympathetically, empathetically, being there to listen to others and requesting and providing information again and again as much as possible, what you know, when you know, being able to share that. So what resonates with you? Either come off mute or ch type into the chat. What resonates? What have you done? What's something else that you might have done that's worked out for you in this sort of ending zone where people are trying to really grasp what's over and how to move on from there? Yeah, Lucille. This couldn't come at a better time. Um, my CEO has um, decided to retire. And on the heels of that, my COO has accepted a new position. And the organization is just, I don't know if I want to use the word imploding, mm. but there's certainly lots of um, emotions. And I, I appreciate acknowledging that there are signs of grieving going on. Yeah. And um making sure that there's space for people to express it in a, you know, in a safe space. And I didn't really connect it to like, yeah, this is a major loss. Our CEO was highly revered, yeah. beloved in most spaces. And his departure, again, on the heels is really kind of rocking the organization. So this is really helpful to acknowledge it and see it and, um, you know, develop strategies to embrace and prepare for it. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I mean, when, when there's a beloved leader and they leave, there's a lot of grief that's going on in the organization. And, and there's a lot of uncertainty too, as we move into that next zone, even if we've accepted the fact that this leader is leaving, what's next? Where are we going? Is the new leader gonna be the same as this old leader? Are we gonna love them as much? Or are they going to treat us the same way? We just don't know. And, and Allison, doesn't... don't we take a lot of that on as our as HR, as the ones that have to kind of fix that yes. and make sure that everybody is, is okay. And then you add in the fact that she's got another executive leaving in addition, yes. so that's even more change. And it's as HR, what do you do? I mean, there's only so much we can do and maybe right. we're grieving a little bit too. And we're having to deal with the loss of that. So it, it, it's a lot, there's no doubt. That's a really important point. And I'm gonna talk a little bit. Um, I know when we got the sort of question as people were registering, a lot of folks talked about overwhelm and I'm gonna get into that in a little bit. Um, but I, PJ, what you brought up about the fact that you are also grieving it is really important because I think as HR professionals, we have the weight of the world on our shoulder to take care of everybody else, but we need to take care of ourselves too. I recently did a, a talk about you know, kindness and being kind to yourself before you can be kind to others, putting your own oxygen mask on first, essentially. And I think that's really important is to acknowledge it within ourselves. And, and just even just naming it is really important to be able to say that, hey, I'm feeling this. And that also allows you to be more empathetic to others because they can see that vulnerability in you that, you know, you don't have to be the one who's just standing there strong. You can say, this impacts me too. And, you know, I, I, this is a big loss, you know, really kind of getting to that level and acknowledging it. And I think that engenders trust. Yeah. So we're going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, your brain on overwhelm. And I want to talk about this neutral zone, because once we've sort of accepted what's ending, we're in this area, this very, very gray area. It's a lot of anxiety. Sometimes motivation drops. Um, sometimes old, we fall back on old weaknesses. You feel overwhelmed. You may see some polarized views within the organization. So really recognizing all of that for yourself and for the people that you're working with, I think is really important. And then thinking about how you can strengthen the in intra-group connections and how you can create, maybe there's some sort of 
forum or something that you can create that's temporary, but that helps people kind of manage this zone of uncertainty, of anxiety. A lot of times this is where creativity emerges too, and people may come up with ideas that we haven't thought about. So maybe in the case of, you know, the leader changing, you know, maybe there's some person that's come up with an idea of, what the new leader can do when they come on board and maybe there's a way to socialize that within the group there may be some creative ideas that pop up um, but really understanding that this is going to take a little bit of time and we don't always have the time and that's the part that's the hardest is that these things happen very quickly and we don't always have the time but the change is taking place during this uncomfortable zone uh, and i do want to talk for a moment about this transition process and what happens in a state of overwhelm, because I think it's important for us to understand for ourselves and for others what happens when we're in the transition process to our brain. So there was a book um, written, I don't even know how many years ago now, called Overwhelmed by um, Bridget Schulte, who was a former Washington Post reporter, and she's just come out with another book uh, just recently. But she cited a study by Yale researchers that used brain scanners on otherwise healthy people in a state of overwhelm. overwhelm. And what was happening is that we have our prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain that is wired for rational thinking and for getting us through you know, the day to day, all of the intellectual type things that we do. But what was going on in a state of overwhelm is that the prefrontal cortex was essentially shutting down and the older ancient part of the brain was taking over. The amygdala was hijacking the rational part of the brain and was releasing um, cortisol, which is the stress hormone, right? And so the stress hormone cortisol is released. It releases glucose into the body. And what happens is that our unnecessary, I put that in quotes a little bit, our unnecessary functions shut down and we go into fight or flight. So a lot of this, and I do, you know, this workshop that I do all around this called It's Not You, It's Your Brain, because I want people to really understand that you don't have control over this. This is happening in your brain and in your body. And so just acknowledging the fact that this is going on with your people is really important. So being aware of this is a step in navigating the change that's happening. And you can take a moment to name it and to try to shift your focus. I'll give you an example of what happens when you're going into overwhelm. Um, I'm gonna talk about my, <clears throat> my child for a moment. I have a middle schooler and last year was the first year that they started middle school, uh, which was an enormous change for them. It meant waking up an hour earlier, it meant catching a bus, which they'd never taken before, it meant having seven different teachers throughout the school day. And they came home the first day and I immediately said to them, how was your day? And I just about got my head bitten off because they were in such a state of overwhelm. They, their amygdala was hijacking, they were in fight or flight. I think they were in both actually because they kind of were fighting me a little bit and giving me nasty responses. And then they immediately fled up to their room and slammed the door. And so they were in this state of overwhelm due to all these changes that were going on. But what they did, and I was very proud of them for doing this, is that they kind of recognized where they were and they put on their relaxation music mix in Spotify. And they sat up there in their room for a while and they listened to their music and they came down a little bit later and they were able to talk about the day. And turns out it wasn't really a bad day. It was just a lot of newness for them. But, you know, being able to recognize when we're going into that state and helping people recognize when they're going into that state, the state of fight or flight, that state where we're not thinking rationally, being able to have some sort of coping mechanism to get through, whether it's meditation, listening to some music, taking a walk. There's a lot of benefits to just going outside for 10 minutes, being able to reset your brain. So these are some things that I recommend both to people I work with in HR, uh, but also to anybody who's going through some sort of change. Does anything resonate with you on this? Are there challenges that you've dealt with where you feel like people have gone into fight or flight and you've not been able to bring them back?
Allison, I have a question. Please. So when when we recognize yes. that our amygdala has been hijacked, um, how what's the fastest way to get ourselves out of that state? Mm -hmm. You know, when you say that, well, there's nothing we can really do about it. I mean, we can take our walks and we can put on our relaxation music. Um, but is there a, a concept of how long it takes to mm -hmm. get unhijacked? It's unfortunately it's different for everybody um, because I think some people and going back to our change dynamics that we talked about in the beginning, some people are more ready for change than others. And I think if you have more of a growth mindset, if you're able to think about things as, you know, if I fail, I can learn from it and I can move forward versus a fixed mindset where you're basically just assuming that everything just stays the same, talents, abilities, you know, are fixed in time and can't change. The more you can kind of promote that growth mindset, the more you can, the quicker you can move past it. And I do think that that just recognizing it and naming it is really important. And then you can do what works for you because what works for you, Crystal, is not going to work for Lisa, is not going to work for Stacy. Um, different things are going to work for different people. I know sometimes for me, I have to get up. I have to, you know, physically stand up and walk somewhere, get out of the space that I'm in and just change my physical location. And that sometimes makes a big difference and helps me reset my mind. But it's going to be different for everybody. And I wish I could say, yes, it takes two days, <laughs> you know, or two hours. I, I wish I could say that, um, but unfortunately it's different for everybody. Well, what I hear you saying is that if we do the work prior to the hijack, yes, right? That if, if we are taking care of ourselves, do, yes. you know, doing that self-care on a regular basis that maybe when those moments happen, you know, we might be able to, to get out of that mm -hmm. state a little faster if it becomes habit if it's something that you do often enough that it's ingrained you know that you are taking care of yourself you've got a hobby that you're able to focus on you how you take walks you stand up every once in a while i have a timer on my phone that actually tells me once an hour just stand up you know just change mm -hmm. your position um and i think if you just get into the habit of doing that it'll become easier yeah. yes thank Thanks. you for that crystal i appreciate it so moving into the new beginning, this is this is an area where, you know, we start to feel a little bit more comfortable, we start to feel maybe even a little bit potentially joyful about a new beginning, really communicating and clarifying the purpose, where we're going, the aspiration, what does this picture of the future look like for us, you know, without without being too sugar coaty about things, but really what are some of the benefits? and celebrating those successes, even the small ones. Sometimes we forget about that. Sometimes we're moving so quickly ahead that we stop, we forget to, to stop and pause and think about, hey, we just had a really good success in whatever it is. Let's say you are, you are in the middle of a reorganization and you've brought on some new people and they're doing a really good job. Why not celebrate that? Why not have something that brings people into contact with one another to get to know each other and celebrate the successes that you are having in this sort of new beginning. So I want you to, for a minute, think about a change that's happening in your organization and think about what transition stage you're in right now. Is it an ending? Is it sort of that neutral zone? Is it a new beginning? Um, or are you not sure? So I think we have a poll here. Yes. Oh, excellent question in the chat. Can it be both a new beginning and an ending at the same time? Yes, I mean, something can be ending and something can be starting. Um, the transition model is what people are going through. So they have to accept that something's ending before they can embrace the new beginning. Um, but yes, in many changes, 
that's what's going on. Something's ending and something's starting. Um, but people are going through the transition process where they, you know, like the trapeze artists, they let go of what was in the past and then they move through and maybe they move quickly through the, the uncertain zone into the new beginning. But most changes do have a new beginning and an ending at the same time. Absolutely. All right. So a lot of folks in that that new beginning phase. Yeah, the new, you're right. The new the Stacy good good point about the neutral zone. It doesn't it doesn't feel very neutral because there is a lot of anxiety going on there. Um, Bridges used the term neutral zone just because it's neither an ending nor a beginning, and it's sort of that gray area in between. But it might have a better name. I mean, maybe we can come up with a better name for it than neutral zone uh, because it is an area of a lot of uncertainty, a lot of anxiety, a lot of overwhelm. Um, so it's not really always the most positive place to be. And there's definitely anxiety that happens. Uh, many different changes going on at once. So you're in different stages. Yeah. And that's very likely to be happening. So kind of figuring out where you are or where people are, because you may be in one place, you may, you may have accepted the new beginning and other people that you're helping may still be stuck in the ending phase and trying to let go and unable to let go and maybe seeing some signs of grief. One of the other things that um, you all mentioned in the um, registration form that you were interested in talking about was resistance. And I wanted to bring that up um, in light of Rick Maurer, who is a researcher on resistance and defined three levels of resistance. First level being intellectual. I don't get it. This is based on facts and figures, it's thinking, it's rational action, it's prefrontal cortex stuff, it's where you're presenting things to people with diagrams and information um, to help them understand what is going on and they maybe still don't get it. There's something missing intellectually. Level two resistance is emotional. I don't like it. They may understand perfectly what's going on, but they don't like it. They don't like the change. Um, and this is a physiological reaction, just like we were talking about a little while ago with overwhelm. This is where blood pressure starts to rise and adrenaline starts to flow through the body. And this is actually based a lot on fear, where people are really afraid of what's going to happen, this, this sort of fear response. And this level two emotional resistance can be triggered without conscious awareness. As can level three. Level three is, is really deeply entrenched stuff. This is personal. This is, I don't like you. I may actually even like the change that's going on, but there I'm resisting you for some reason. It could be of a relate relationship reason. It could be that, and, and when I say you, I could mean you as an HR professional. I could mean a leader of the change. They may be resisting based on past history or based on a personality conflict. Um, so this is a really difficult level of change to get, or level of resistance rather, to get over. But I'm gonna talk through each one and see where we kind of can come up with some ways to work with the resistance or overcome the resistance. So we know that intellectually, this is, the, this is the easiest one to get over because this is just resulting from lack of information or maybe we disagree with the data or we, we don't understand what the data means when we're presenting to somebody. You know, this is what the new organization is going to look like. Well, I don't see myself in this box. Where is my box? Or, you know, really being able to clarify what's going on, but more importantly, the why, why this is happening, um, and using language that's easily understood by the audience, and using multiple communication channels. Sometimes we think that, you know, we send the email, it's got all the information, of course, everybody read it and understands it, but that may not always be the case. We might be looking at doing some sort of a, an in-person session, a Zoom session, a one-on-one. -on -one. There might be office hours that we need to hold. Whether we're a leader or whether we're supporting the change, there might be ways to 
use different communication channels with different groups of people. Um, and the most important part, I, I skipped over, but I did that on purpose because establishing credibility is the basis for everything. So people are not necessarily going to agree with the data if they don't think that you're credible. So doing the things that you say you're going to do, having the credentials to be able to say, you know, yes, and you're HR experts. So if you're doing an organizational change, your expertise is very credible. Sometimes with leaders in organizations, you know, they may not be perceived as credible when they're moving around boxes for an organization. So it's really important to establish the credibility um, and then explain the why and use the right language and use multiple communication channels. When we get to the emotional stage, this is really getting a lot harder, right? Because you can't just say, you know, hey, get over it. And other people are going to say, oh, yeah, 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 I'm, I'm over it. Thanks. I needed that. Um, when when this phase kicks in, this is where people start to go into overwhelm again. And so as we talked about before, stress hormone cortisol is being released and people are feeling that fight or flight um, syndrome. So it's very difficult. Um, and no matter how great your information might be intellectually, it's probably going to fall on deaf ears if the deep seated emotional needs aren't met. And a lot of organizations, and I don't know all of your different organizations, um, sometimes the emotional part isn't encouraged, the open dialogue. And as leaders in HR, that's where we come in to encourage open dialogue, you know, asking about what they're thinking, helping to that, helping them to engage in the process and modeling open dialogue as well. Having the opportunities for people to come and talk to you, having the opportunities for them to talk to leaders if possible, um, really starts to get at that emotional piece. Engaging them in the process, people of course tend to support things that they've had a hand in building and really empathizing with them, but also emphasizing the what's in it for them, the with them. Um, this is where we start to talk about, you know, those those benefits of the new beginning. So there might be something that's ending, but what's beneficial to this person, to this team, to this group? What's going to be better for them? So emphasizing that, the what's in it for them. And on a personal level, this is really difficult. You know, this gets more and more difficult as we go up the different levels of resistance. Sometimes what we need to do, and I encourage you to also work with the leaders in the organization that might be, you know, championing this change. There may be things that have led to tense relationships. There may be tense relationships between you and staff. There may be tense relationships between leaders and staff. There may be tense relationships intra-staff and really being able to accept responsibility for what might have caused this and really doing some soul searching around that. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're admitting fault on things, but it's definitely saying that, hey, there might have been some things in the past that have led to this stage. Let's see if we can kind of work through it. Let's spend a little bit more time together on a personal level and let's kind of use that, that kindness approach, kindness to ourselves, kindness to others, and empathy and really try to engage. Um, I know that I've had a few folks that I've worked with in the past who don't see things the same way that I do. And until I had a chance to sit down with them one on one and maybe even start the conversation just connecting with them on other things, maybe it's about you know, their kids, their dog, the last vacation that they took, something that gets into positive affect, and then really trying to pull back the layers and uncover what the issues are. Um, it's really important that we connect with people on an individual level, that we keep the commitments that we've made. Um, and this last one about allowing yourself to be influenced by the people who resist you is not to say giving into demands um, of what they're saying, but it's to admit that you can consider other things potentially. There might be something that somebody comes up with, especially in that that gray area where sometimes the anxiety brings creativity. Maybe there's something worth considering that you hadn't considered before. And these are the kinds of the kinds of skills that we use to 
lessen the tension between us and someone else who might be resisting us as opposed to resisting the idea. So I'm going to pause for a moment and ask you, what are some of the things that you've run up against in terms of resistance and what have you tried? I know resistance is big. Anything that comes to mind, feel free to use the chat as well. Feedback surveys. Oh, that's a great suggestion. Maggie, what do you mean when you say legacy staff? Is it resistance by legacy staff to a, to a new change? Is that what you're, you're talking about? I assume extreme resistance, yeah. Have you ever um, worked with the legacy staff in more of a partnership model where they get to contribute more to, you know, sort of the changes that are going on? And I know sometimes that's out of our control. We think about, you know, the circles of control and the circles of influence, and sometimes this is completely out of our control, um, but any opportunity to get them more engaged and involved in, in the changes that are going on, or they completely resist that too. They don't even want to be involved. I can say, Allison, um, while Maggie's uh, responding there, uh, we definitely have the same problem. When we've done engagement surveys and we look at the demographics of those that are certainly not as happy as the yeah. staff that are newer to the organization, and maybe it's because they've seen more and been there longer and are just that much more resistant to change, they definitely are, I would say, they definitely are unhappy. There, there's no way around it. And it's, and it's hard when you've got employees that have been there for so long, they don't want to deal with change. They don't want any part of it because in their minds, it was better before. Anything right. you do is always better. Right, right. And that and that's a really hard shift to make because that's so deeply embedded. Um, have you, you know, when, when you work with them, what are the kinds of things that you've done to help them see like maybe small benefits? I mean, they're never going to buy in to the big picture, right? They're always going to say it was better in the past. But have you done anything to help them recognize that there might be small benefits of the change, like maybe something that's in it for them specifically? Like, will they have more of an opportunity to lead in the new organization? Will they have an opportunity to get recognized because their legacy? I, I don't know what would yeah. resonate with them because each each person is different, right? And we all have different motivators. Um, but I'm curious as to whether any benefits have been cited that have helped sort of move the needle just a tiny little bit? Yeah, I would say um, it looks like Maggie's saying that they've launched community conversations. I was just about to say something very similar, having one-on-one -on -one conversations, having listening sessions with small groups, yes. allowing them to feel heard. Yes, yes, I think that's great. I think that's really important. Um, and that's also the communication in multiple ways and multiple forums to have small groups, to have one-on-ones. You know, communication isn't just sharing a PowerPoint or send, sending an email. It's really giving people the opportunity to to engage in what's going on. So these affinity groups, yeah, yeah, the employee resource groups. I think those are really, really important. And I think you just have to keep at it. Um, it's not going to be a quick process, especially with employees who've been there for a really long time. But once you get one or two of them on board, they can also serve as change champions for you. So if you can get a few people to see a few benefits of the new beginning of what the change is, then you people will listen more to their peers than they're going to listen to some top leader, to somebody in HR, they're gonna to listen to their peers. And so if we can get a few people on board through sort of showing them what's in it for them, then we can use them as change champions as well.
oh, sure, people resistance to change because of di diagnosed anxiety in general, and then the change increases the anxiety. And yes, I mean, Stacy, that's so true. And it's something that is, is, I think, so much more rampant these days, too. And the fact that we we are okay admitting that we have anxiety, which I think is really important. I think it's important that people are able to say that they have this and that they can, you know, look to others perhaps for some support. And I think, you know, again, having others in the same boat, like we talked about in the change dynamics, knowing that others are going through it. We were saying earlier that not a lot of you felt alone in the change, and that's great, but people might people might feel really alone, especially if they're already suffering from some anxiety. So I wanna talk just for a moment or two about sort of this idea of resilience and what do you do when things don't go the way that you hoped? We, we're trying a lot of different activities. We're trying to engage people. We know that there's anxiety. We know that the amygdala is hijacking um, our rational brains and we need to be able to also understand that we are telling ourselves stories about what's going on with people in the organization and everybody is telling themselves stories as well um, we are the stories that we tell ourselves and i'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the work of brene brown and you might remember a story that she tells about a time when she and her husband were at their lake house and she was really looking forward to going for a swim with him. I see Crystal's nodding, Cheryl. We've heard this one before. And it's all about the stories that she was telling herself because she was really looking forward to this outing. And she got in the water and she started swimming. And, you know, she turned back to her husband and made a comment about, oh, isn't this wonderful? I'm really enjoying this with you. And he kind of just made a very non-committal reply like, uh-huh, you know, and, and she said, going on he's usually more ebullient about things like this um and she kept swimming for a little while and she said oh isn't this wonderful steve aren't you enjoying this and he just kind of grunted again and then she started telling herself all these stories that oh my gosh steve isn't enjoying himself it must be me he must not like swimming with me anymore i must look terrible in my bathing suit all of these things that she's telling herself. And finally, you know, she gets out of the water and she's just really frustrated now because he hasn't been enjoying this experience that she was so looking forward to. And she finally asks him, you know, Steve, what was going on when we were in the water? It seemed like you were really not enjoying things. And I was hoping to share this wonderful experience with you. Is it me? Is it what I'm wearing? Is it you know, what's going on? And he says to her that, you know, last night I had this terrible nightmare that we were out swimming and a boat came by and almost killed us. And I had a panic attack. I was literally having a panic attack and you were asking me all these questions about how I'm feeling and I couldn't respond. And then all of a sudden she realized she had been making up these stories and been telling herself these stories when in reality he was suffering through something else and she didn't even realize it. So we are the stories that we tell ourselves. And just like with the overwhelm, it's important that we recognize the gaps that we're filling in with our own stories. And telling, you know, listening to other people talk and trying to help them understand their stories is really something that we can do. Um, sharing ours, listening to them, trying to help figure out what are those stories that we're telling ourselves and what are other people telling themselves as well. Um, I know we're starting to get short on time, so I want to go to my last slide here about what do we do next? And we've talked about a lot of these. This is a bit of a, a recap, but being able to understand the dynamics of change and transition and seeking out information, using all of your available resources. Some are not immediately obvious to you, like the coffee cups that we used in the beginning exercise, asking questions, answering questions, engaging, being aware of your own emotional state, being aware of others' emotional state is really important, being able to name it, and it's okay. It's okay to experience the grief. It's okay to experience the anxiety while you're moving through these phases of transition. And it's okay for you to put on your oxygen mask first. Look to others when you need support. Provide support to others when you're able. Be mindful of the stories that you tell yourself and give yourself credit 
when you successfully navigate change. We don't always do that. We sometimes just move on to the next, celebrate the wins, give yourself some credit. This is really tough work that we're doing. So I think we have a minute or two for any further questions, and then I have one closing slide um, to, to share. So any any other questions or comments? I know this is really tough work. All right, well, I casually alluded to Joy early on, and I wanted to just offer you, um, I'm doing a, a workshop on Joy in November. And if any of you or any of your people are interested, I would like to gift you a registration. Um, I would love to see some of you come. We're going to be talking about ways to reframe your experience um, in terms of joy and joy junctures and building joy practices. Um, so this is also a way to kind of the opposite of grief when we're talking about going through the grief process how do we come out on the other end and have some joy so i've been working with a friend of mine who's a professional artist um, and we actually use a lot of her artwork in the session um, so we'll send out these slides and you'll have this link um, and the code to join if you are interested i'd love to see you there and reach out anytime. I'll send you all my contact information. Um, please feel free to reach out, connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm always happy to have even a short conversation. We could set up a 15 minute conversation and talk through some of these things. Always happy to do that. Allison, we can't thank you enough. Uh, I think that as we're seeing in the chat, so many of us are already dealing with challenges, have or unfortunately, we'll be dealing with them in the future as things come up. And a lot of times we're not even aware of what may be coming or we are and then trying to figure out how best to deal with that. So we can't tell you how much we appreciate all of the guidance and the resources that you've offered. And as Allison said, please make sure that you're looking at internally as well and applying these things to yourself because there's so much that we can do for others, but do make sure that you, as she said, put that oxygen mask on first and definitely make sure that you're taking care of yourselves. Thank you again, everybody, so much for joining us. We hope everybody has a great rest of the day and has a fantastic weekend. Thanks, everybody. Bye.